and this is what I look like. So sorry, I didn't turn on my camera. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you as well. Absolutely. OK, we're going to go ahead and get started. It is uh, truly an honor to have Dr. Ashida Tolwani uh, joining us uh, for Grand Rounds, our uh, Roy Banking Department of Internal Medicine Grand Rounds. And Dr. Tolwani is Professor of Medicine and the Edwin, Edwin Rutsky Endowed Chair in Nephrology at the University of Alabama in Birmingham, UAB. Uh, Dr. Tolwani, uh, they must have a saying at UAB here, we at USF say you stay forever when <laughs> you rise through the ranks of USF. So uh, Dr. Tawani would have a, whatever are the equivalents for U, A, and B that would be similar to you stay forever. So graduate of the UAB College of Medicine, graduate of the Internal Medicine Residency, graduate of the Nephrology Fellowship, and then joined the faculty in 1999 um, just at the uh, as the century was about to turn, uh, joined in 1999 and has remained uh, her entire career at uh, UAB. During that time, uh, Dr. Tawani uh, should have made an investment in bookshelves because she needs <laughs> several bookshelves to hold the many awards that she has won for teaching. Uh, and literally, her CV. Uh, goes about four or five pages for awards alone, which is quite impressive. Uh, but she is revered by her former UAB students, including Dr. Anthony Canella in our Department of Infectious Diseases, um, who was there for internal medicine uh, residency in the 2000s. She's revered by her former medical students and her former residents and fellows and current residents and fellows for her outstanding teaching. Um, she, uh, again, has 114 peer-reviewed publications, 21 textbook, uh, textbook chapters uh, written, over 85 poster publications, and, um, and has sat on editorial review boards, is an active member in numerous nephrology societies, and um, is just absolutely, uh, it is an absolute delight to have her speak here. One of her main research interests is one of her uh, is the topic of her grand rounds, uh, and that's acute kidney injury. And her title is Emerging Concepts and New Insights in Acute Kidney Injury. So um, it is again an honor, Dr. Tawani, to have you. And 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 I have satisfied all the UAB uh, former medical students, uh, former residents, uh, who would be extremely disappointed if I didn't give you the very a uh, well-deserved introduction that you deserve for what has been truly an outstanding career. So we are honored to have you and I look forward to uh, hearing your grand rounds as does our audience today. Well, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. And I am so honored to be able to be here with you virtually and excited to talk to you about something that's very near and dear to me, which is acute kidney injury and bringing awareness. So. My topic, as you know, is emerging concepts and new insights in acute kidney injury. And these are my disclosures, and essentially they're not relevant to the topic at hand. So my objectives today is not only to review the epidemiology of AKI, but also define AKI by the current definitions, where those definitions came from and what is gonna be emerging. We're going to review the limitations of those definitions discuss the role of future biomarkers, and then end up with some cases and talk about management. So I'm gonna start with the impact of AKI and present all the way down to pathophysiology and management. So let's set the stage. So why is this so important no matter what field you are in? Well, the impact of AKI is very impactful. So first of all, what is acute kidney injury? So it's a syndrome encompassing a wide variety of etiologies and pathophysiological processes that leads to decreased kidney function. Dr. Tolwani, I'm yes? sorry to interrupt, but are you moving forward on your slides? Yes. Um, it's still on your title slide right oh, now. Okay. Let me see if this um, moves. Let me use the other cursor. Does this move? No, it's not moving forward now. 
Okay, that's okay. I will take it off presenter mode and it, we will do it this way. Well, all right, start again. Okay, let's see. It was moving earlier. Yes, it was How's working that? fine. We good? Much better. Yes, it's working now. Thank you. Right, you got it. Okay, so pretty much I reviewed my objectives and my AKI outline. So we'll start at what's really important, which is the impact of acute kidney injury. So let's go there. So acute kidney injury, I've already described what it is to you, and it's really a syndrome encompassing a wide variety of etiologies and pathophysiological processes, and that can lead to decreased kidney function. And if you look at the current definitions we have, which we will go over, really it's very common. So that's why all subspecialties and specialties need to know about it. It's really 21% of all hospital admissions, according to literature, will develop acute kidney injury. And this is even higher in the ICU population where it can be up to 60%. And what we now have realized, which I'm gonna present you some of the data supporting this, is that AKI is a major risk factor for chronic kidney disease and end-stage kidney disease, even after a patient has initial recovery of kidney function to what we think is normal. We also know that AKI is an independent risk factor for mortality. We used to think that the kidneys were a basically a poor bystander that got injured in various processes and that didn't contribute to the mortality, but now we know there's an independent risk factor for mortality. And again, I'll present you some of the supporting data. What's even more scary is worldwide, 2 million people will die this year with AKI. So I hope I have established why this topic is important and dear to me and why I think bringing awareness of acute kidney injury is very important. So let's start with the case. So a 45-year-old gentleman is hospitalized with cirrhosis and spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. His medications include spironolactone, ciprofloxacin, and lactulose. And his initial serum creatinine on admission is 1.4 milligrams with a CKD uh, with a epi by CKD epi and EGFR of 60 milliliters per minute per 1.73 meters squared. He undergoes a diagnostic paracentesis for spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, and his creatinine rises to 2.3 on day four of hospital admission. So the question I have that I want you to think about, does this patient meet the criteria for acute kidney injury? So just a reminder, his creatinine has gone up from 1.4 to 2.3 over a four day period. So I want you to think about this and then I'm going to go forward and see if your answer changes. So if you look at the definitions of AKI, they've evolved over the years. And the current definition, which has been stable since 2012, defines AKI by this. It's an increase in the serum creatinine greater than 0.3 milligrams per deciliter in 48 hours, or an increase in serum creatinine greater than or equal to 1.5 to 1.9 times the baseline in seven days, or a urine output less than 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour for six hours. So that is a current definition of AKI. And most of us use the creatinine definition since getting urine output sometimes can be difficult in the hospital setting. So once you've diagnosed AKI, there's also a staging system. And in the staging system, essentially what you see is that you have increasing levels of creatinine and dropping urine outputs to stage the kidney function. So in stage two, your creatinine is about two times the baseline. In stage three, three times the baseline. And you can see the following urine outputs. Now, why that's important and how these definitions were made, we will go through in a couple of slides. But now looking back at this case, I think all of you can say, of course, this patient has acute kidney injury. His creatinine has gone from 1.4 to 2.3, which is 1.6 times from the baseline over a four day period. So now let's take a look at how those definitions came about. How do we establish those criteria? Well, the reason those criteria were established was based on multiple studies looking at where mortality and morbidity increases. And what's scary to think is that studies have shown, this is just one of them, that if you have an increase in creatinine greater than or equal to 0.3, that's sustained 
your mortality increases, your odds of death. And as you have increasing severity of renal function based on the creatinine, your mortality increases further. 0.3 is a very small number. And this has been validated in multiple studies. So now we know, and this is just one study that initially started this, that AKI has been shown to be an independent risk factor for mortality in the ICU, and that small changes in creatinine have been associated with increased mortality. This was a study of 9,000 patients admitted in Boston, where they looked at the data when two creatinines were presented. And what they discovered with a change of 0.5 greater than the baseline creatinine, this increased your odds of death by 6.5, your length of stay by 3.5 days, and in cost, cost much more, increased your cost of about 8,000 more than someone who did not develop AKI. And this is controlling for confounders. So they control for age and other confounders and the same association held. And now multiple, multiple studies have shown the same thing. So now if you were to guess, what is the mortality of ICU patients with AKI who require dialytic therapy? So I want you to think about this since we already talked about the definition, we're gonna move on to talk about the outcomes based on this definition. And the answer is, if you have correctly thought this through your head, is, or in your head, over 40%. And how do we know this? Again, multiple studies, which I'm just going to present a few just to state the, state the stage of why, or set the stage of why this is so important, have shown this. So this is probably one of the largest studies done. It was a meta-analysis all over the world using the KDGO current definition that I just gave you of over 3 million patients over a long study period of about eight years. And so the pooled incidence of AKI in this whole set of hospitalized patients was about 22%, very similar to what I presented to you on one of my first slides. And what you can see in this slide is that the overall, again, mortality was 22%, but if you're in the ICU setting, that increased to over 40%. And again, as multiple other studies have shown, as you increase in staging of AKI, i.e. severity of the kidney dysfunction, your mortality linearly increases. And this is a huge study, again, multiple studies supporting this. So what do we know now of the natural history of AKI? Well, when I was a fellow, we thought that, okay, you have normal kidney function, you get an insult, and then you have full recovery of the kidneys afterwards. But now what we have determined and multiple, again, studies showing this, is that's actually not true. That a significant portion of patients develop either chronic kidney disease, or they never even recover from their AKI and develop end-stage kidney disease. And even if your creatinine goes back to normal, studies have shown that the renal reserve is lost and that these patients over time do progress to CKD. And this is whether you are an adult or a child. And this is controlling for other comorbidities and confounders. So what are these long-term outcomes after acute kidney injury? So there is good data summarizing the association of AKI with CKD and end-stage kidney disease. This is just one meta-analysis. And again, I'm just trying to validate to you that there is good data looking at this and supporting this. So this basically shows that the development of CKD in multiple of these different studies had increased, you have AKI, as well as the development of end-stage kidney disease on various studies that have been looked at. If you look at other long-term renal outcomes after AKI, this was specifically a prospective cohort study of patients looking specifically at not just mortality, but cardiovascular events. And what they did is they took these patients with AKI and survived hospitalization and matched those with patients who didn't have AKI. And then they followed up these patients over a period of several months, first zero months at time zero, three months, 12 months, 24 months, and 36 months over time. They measured their AGFR, EGFR during these appointments and proteinuria. And essentially, again, AKI was shown to increase the risk of kidney complications, heart failure, and death in patients 
compared to patients who did not develop AKI controlling for other confounders. And that it was really important that we follow up these patients to see if we can change some of their outcomes because a substantial amount of these patients do develop proteinuria, which then portends even a poorer prognosis over time for the kidneys and cardiovascular health. So now that I've given you a brief look at the epidemiology and some supporting evidence that AKI is bad in so many different ways, let's go on now and talk about the definitions. So I've just been through acute kidney injury and you are all aware of CKD, but now something that's evolving in the future is this concept of acute kidney disease. Because what we know based on the definitions is that AKI only covers a seven day period. And then chronic kidney disease is if you have impaired kidney function over at least a three month period. So what happens in between those patients have acute kidney injury after seven days? And so now the terminology that you're gonna see is acute kidney disease and more studies are being done now to look at this group of patients has a different prognostication or prognosis than those who don't meet this criteria. And so far it's showing that the outcomes are still poor, but stay tuned. This is where the definitions are evolving. And we'll talk even more about the emerging evidence for new definitions. So now we have this definition, however, it's not very good. Why? Because it's creatinine based, which is a big problem. We know that serum creatinine is not sensitive. It's influenced by age, muscle mass, gender, race. We know that's not specific. When you have an elevated serum creatinine, you don't know if the patient actually has structural disease or not. And we know that the reason probably for the poor prognosis in these patients is that the rise in the serum creatinine is delayed at least two or three days after injury. Finally, we also know that the serum creatinine is unreliable because you can be diluted or can be diluted in fluid therapy. Also, we have learned that in septic states, the production of serum creatinine is decreased, so falsely lowering the serum creatinine. And finally, there may be some issues with the way creatinine is measured at the lab that can interfere other substances that can give you a false level or increased level. So this is a relationship I was just referring to about the GFR and creatinine. And as you can see, when you have acute kidney injury, the GFR falls dramatically quickly while the creatinine is delayed. So let me tell you why this is relevant and why these definitions are limited by giving you two, three scenarios. So here we have a 68 year old man with longstanding hypertension and stage three A CKD who presents to the hospital with a UTI. So scene, scenario number one, on day three of admission, he is in septic shock, requiring vasopressors. His serum creatinine has increased from 1.2 to 1.6 milligrams per deciliter. Scenario two, instead he has hypertensive urgency. By day three of admission, his, he has mild sepsis in this scenario, which is resolved, and his blood pressure is better controlled. His blood pressure systolic has gone from 170s to 130s. However, serum creatinine has increased from 1.2 to 1.6. Finally, in scenario three, for his infection, he's treated with Bactrim. And of course, on day three of admission, again, sepsis is completely resolved, but his serum creatinine is increased by the same amount. So all these different scenarios have stage one AKI, but do they have the same cause of AKI? And why is that important? Because we know different etiologies have different prognosis. And so this outlines or highlights why serum creatinine is a poor marker for acute kidney injury. So if you look at serum creatinine, it basically follows this type of box, what I'm showing you here, a diagram. So if you have a serum creatinine based AKI, essentially you have no damage and your creatinine is normal, we say you have no kidney injury. That's in the left upper side of the box seen in green. If you have an increased creatinine, we assume there's damage and you have a diagnosis of intrinsic acute kidney injury, injury as seen in box D. And this is what we normally call a clinical acute tubular injury since ATN or acute tubular injury is the most common cause of AKI in the hospital setting. What we don't 
recognize with this type of depiction is that prerenal azotemia is where you have an increased serum creatinine, but no structural damage. And you can also have patients with structural damage, but the creatinine's not increasing. And so this is where the definition is flawed. So you have hemodynamic AKI, which you have elevation and creatinine, but there's actually no damage. And then you have this early AKI or subclinical AKI, which is damage without loss of function, meaning the creatinine's not increased. So either the damage was not severe enough or the renal reserve was high enough not to see an actual functional change by serum creatinine level. So now, why is this important? Because reduced GFR from a hemodynamic component like pre-renal is very different from having intrinsic acute kidney injury and the outcomes are different. So AKI using serum creatinine rise is a marker of decreased glomerular filtration, not kidney injury. And in this situation, you cannot differentiate hemodynamic AKI versus structural injury. So exa po examples of positive or false positive AKIs where you have this problem is like pre-renal azotemia, as I've already alluded to, hepatorenal syndrome and cardiorenal syndrome, where the elevation in creatinine does not necessarily correlate with an increased mortality depending on the underlying condition. Then you have issues with no change in GFR. You have drugs that can inhibit tubular secretion of creatinine, so it looks like a reduced GFR, but actually it doesn't cause any functional damage. So really why this is important specifically in the box B is that we know that there's no good treatments for acute kidney injury secondary to acute tubular necrosis. So by having creatinine as the definition or in the definition of acute kidney injury, we're missing this early AKI or subclinical AKI, which may be a window of opportunity for AKI drugs that might be missed within these 48 hours. That's why this is important. And let's now go to see how this relates to a conceptual model for AKI. So right now, if you look at the marker we have, this is what we see, normal kidney function, patients at increased risk, you actually have damage, then your GFR falls, then you develop kidney failure, and then you develop death. So essentially, your creatinine is delayed in this whole spectrum to where the purple kidney is with a decreased GFR. But if we had other parameters that can detect acute kidney injury earlier, maybe by identifying patients are susceptible or early damage, we could have targets for early intervention that may change the outcomes for these patients. So could we have other biomarkers or are there other biomarkers becoming available that can help this? We also would like to have biomarkers that track progression, that once you have acute kidney injury, are there biomarkers that can track whether that acute kidney injury is gonna to progress to a more severe stage or not? And clearly, creatinine doesn't meet any of those criteria. This is where creatinine is seen to be elevated, as I mentioned. So if you had a good biomarker, what would we want? We would want the world. We want it to be able to predict and diagnose AKI early. We wanted to identify the primary location of injury, pinpoint the type, whether it's pre-renal AKI or CKD, duration and severity of AKI, identify the etiology, predict clinical outcomes, and we want to be able to monitor response to interventions and treatments because currently we do not have that with creatinine. And possibly we can expedite the drug de development process by knowing which patients are susceptible and will have risk of having acute kidney injury. So I call this that like we have troponin in the cardiology literature, we're in search for a kidney troponin that truly can tell us more about what's going on with the kidney. And so these are multiple biomarkers that have been looked at over the years over creatinine. You have proximal tubular injury biomarkers, biomarkers that decrease glomerular filtration. Uh, we have biomarkers that predict stress to the kidney. You can see all the different biomarkers here. And what I'm going to talk about later is the ones that are more relevant now. So this, looks, this graph shows you some of the different biomarkers, why they're considered to be better or potentially better than serum creatinine. So you can see on the x-axis time, and then on the y-axis relative levels of the biomarker, 
And the serum creatinine is line is manifested by the black dashes. And all these other biomarkers show you they peak much more th sooner than you see a change in, in creatinine. So these are the ones associated with tubular damage. So believe it or not, you already have some biomarkers you can use to help in addition to creatinine that you may or may not be utilizing now. And then we'll talk about some biomarkers not readily available out of all the ones that I briefly showed you on that table that are more applicable to what's coming in the future. So let's start with the biomarkers you have in your hospital. And I'm going to speak specifically because of the time just on the fresamide stress test and the role of the urinalysis. So what is a fresamide stress test? That is essentially giving patients, critical care patients, since they have the highest mortality, basically giving them a diuretic to see if their tubules response by the production of urine. So this is something that probably we've been doing for years in nephrology, but it's just been now more formalized. And it's used to predict the severity of acute kidney injury. So this was a 77 patient multicentral trial and they challenged those who had early hypervolemia or euvolemia and AKI with a one-time dose of fresamide. So if these patients had not been exposed to fresamide before, they gave one milligram per kilogram, or if you had exposure to 1.5 milligrams per kilogram. Again, these were ICU patients. And then they followed the urine output following the fresamide stress test. And what they showed is that the urine output could predict the increase in severity of staging of AKI from stage one to stage two to stage three by urine output. And what they showed is if you are able or a patient after having the fresamide stress test that within two hours can make a urine, can, urine output is less than 200 cc's and within a two hour period, then they have a high likelihood of needing dialysis in the future. So basically what this shows are the patients by urine output. Stripe bars are the ones that progress to worsening stages of AKI. You can see the urine output or response to this resumite stress test was low compared to a robust response as seen in the gray bars and those patients did not progress. Many other studies now have substantiated the fresamide stress test. This was again an international multicenter perspective observational study, looking again at patients who had stage one or stage two AKI and seeing if the fresamide stress test can predict the need of dialysis. And this study itself actually validated the cutoffs that I already told you, which is 200 cc's of urine over a two hour period, less than 200 cc's in a two hour period, they also had a high sensitivity in this study and specificity for showing that those patients were gonna move on to needing dialysis, which again is a whole nother topic of controversy is when do you initiate dialysis? So given that, that's exactly what people have used it for to see if it can be determined of when to initiate dialysis. So this is a study, basically it was a randomized trial. A, it was basically a pilot study looking at if the fresamide stress test can predict dialysis in patients. And so essentially what they showed is that in patients who failed in this particular study or failed the fresamide stress test, i.e. had less than 200 cc's of urine output in two hours, 87% of them needed dialysis, which is pretty good. Those who passed, which was 44 patients, only six out of those ended up needing dialysis in the future. So it's a relatively good test. And now studies are looking at the use of this test with other biomarkers to see if we can increase the area under the curve and the specificity and sensitivity. The other thing you can utilize in your hospital is your analysis scores. And I don't know how many of you look at urine, but we look at urine all the time. And there are several groups listed here in the slide that based on the number of casts you see in the urine sediment or renal tubular epithelial cells have made a prediction score of the likelihood that they have the severity of AKI and that they have actually have acute tubular necrosis, which again, or ATI, acute tubular injury, is the most common cause of AKI in the hospital setting. So all of these studies reported that in the first study, Chawla, if you have grade three or grade four, that was highly predictive of having progressive ATN. 
for Parazella and Bagshaw, if you have grade two or above, that was very highly predictive of ATN. And you can see in this slide what characterized the point system. So for instance, for Parazella's scoring, which is probably the most predominant used, that you developed or you, the patient got two points if they had greater than six equal to six casts per low power field or greater than equal to six renal tubular epithelial cells per high power field. For those who, if you need a visual, these are what granular casts look like. So the top three boxes represent muddy brown granular casts. The bottom box to the right is what a renal tubular epithelial cell looks like, which also is a marker for acute tubular injury. And these cells are larger than white cells. So not only have studies shown that the urine sediment itself can be predictive of having true acute tubular necrosis and the severity of AKI, but that serial urinalyses are even more predictive. And I've started already in my practice for patients with AKI is getting serial urinalyses to see how they change. And basically what this showed is that in this particular study, single center, 121 patients, and they took these patients who had stage two or stage three AKI, looked at their urines daily. And by looking at them daily, they increased the risk using either the Parazella score or the Chola score of, of diagnosing acute kidney injury or acute tubular necrosis, I should say, by 23%. So serial urine microscopy exams increase the diagnostic value of ATI, otherwise not identified by just a single examination. And that's what they concluded. And in my own practice, I've discovered the same. So I'm a big believer of urine microscopy. So now that we talked a little bit about the biomarkers you should be using or consider using in your practice, let's talk about the biomarkers that are not readily available yet, but they're coming soon. And these are the ones that I'm gonna focus on for diagnosing, again, acute tubular injury. So let's start with NGAL, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard about. So NGAL is upregulated when kidney tubular cells are damaged, and it's an early marker compared to creatinine of acute kidney injury, specifically in ischemic, septic, and nephrotoxic insults. It's also been associated with prolonged hospitalization, need for dialysis, and death. And it is available in most other countries. You can see that Europe's already using it, Canada, Korea, Israel. Currently, it's under evaluation by the US under the FDA. Also, NGAL has now been shown to be pretty good at distinguishing acute tubular injury from, from hepatorenal syndrome in patients with decompensated cirrhosis, which we know that's a very hard diagnosis to make. And we're trying to implement or get NGAL at our institution specifically for that regards. So there was a landmark study in children years ago, 71 children, post-operative cardiovascular surgery, where they used NGAL to predict acute kidney injury. And they used either the blood level or the urine level. And the urine level predicted almost by an area under the curve of almost 100 or you know, one, the development of acute kidney injury. The blood was not as good, but pretty good as you can see here for the area under the curve. So in children or kids, NGAL looks to be a very good biomarker for predicting ATI. However, this has not been shown to be consistent in the adult population. Uh, this is a meta-analysis of 52 studies that looked at urine and plasma NGAL, and urine is better of over 13,000 patients looking at the accuracy and cutoff values and predicting severe acute kidney injury, meaning stage two or stage three. And essentially, the area under the curve, the sensitivity and specificity varied according to the underlying condition of the patient. And they concluded that they do help in predicting patients at a high risk of AKI, but they really require more perspective validation because there was a lot of variation from the different studies. So you have to know exactly when to use in which setting. And right now I would say that it is pretty well been shown in more and more studies that it's useful. And I, like I said, uh, distinguishing hepatorenal syndrome from ATN and decompensated cirrhosis. So let's now go back to those scenarios. You probably forgot about them by now. So I'm gonna remind you. So in the first 
scenario, remember in all three scenarios, the patient's blood pressure increased from 1.2 to 1.6. So in the first scenario, the patient was in septic shock on vasopressors. The second scenario, the patient had hypertensive of urgency and the blood pressure got better controlled over the next three days. And the third scenario was a patient with sepsis, not septic shock treated with Bactrim. So let's see how these biomarkers can help you with the diagnosis, which creatinine cannot do. So in septic shock, if I told you by microscopy, you see RTE cells and granular casts, and by Parazella score of two points, then probably you're going to think that this patient likely has true acute tubular injury. And especially if I tell you the NGAL is increased. The GFR is reduced, yes. And you have tubular injury, inj excuse me, tubular injury is confirmed because of your analysis and is supported by the increased NGAL. Now, in the second scenario, let's say I tell you the urine analysis is bland. So in this setting, this is probably not an AKI or true AKI. It's more hemodynamic mediated by the blood pressure control. So the NGAL would be unchanged in this setting. The GFR would be used, reduced because it is a pre-renal physiology, but there'd be no tubular injury. And the trimethoprine group, you would expect the urine microscopy to be bland. The NGAL should be unchanged and you wouldn't have a reduced GFR or tubular injury. So these are how these biomarkers and use of the ones we have available and the ones that are up and coming can help you distinguish in different situations what is a true acute kidney injury or not and help distinguish by maybe some of the causes, at least hemodynamic mediated versus intrinsic injury. So now let's talk about some of these other biomarkers you may have heard of. So one is called the nephrocheck and these are essentially markers that reflect the renal response to injury or stress. So you have the urinary tissue inhibitor of metalloproteinases 2, an insulin-like growth factor binding protein 7, much easier to just call it the nephrocheck. And these studies have been shown ahead of time again to predict acute tubular injury in patients in the ICU setting at risk for AKI. They've been validated in several cohorts. And what this slide shows, one of the cohorts of 728 ICU patients is that they were able to find two cutoffs where it showed a high sensitivity and specificity for the early detection of AKI. And it responded, this marker, which you can see on this graph to the right side, this particular biomarker combination was much better than some of the others that were listed in the previous slides, including NGAL in the ICU setting. They then validated this biomarker in other studies with large ICU cohorts and really established the prediction from getting no AKI or stage one to stage two or three AKI, so progressive AKI within 12 hours of a patient's admission to the ICU and showed again this sensitivity and specificity was pretty good for the cutoff markers of 0.3 and 2.0. So 0.3 had a negative predictive value of 97% and a positive predictive value of 18%, while 2.0 had a negative predictive value of 93% and a positive predictive value of 49%. So guess what? This is available. I don't know if you're using this at your institution, but it was approved by the FDA in September of 2014. And the, what it was approved for is for risk prediction of moderate to severe AKI within 12 hours. And of course the intended use was adult ICU patients and the cutoff was greater than 0 0.3. And you can see this is what the nephrocheck looks like. But the issue is, okay, we have these biomarkers that essentially can predict AKI before an increase in creatinine, but can it change anything? What's the point of using them? They're very expensive, et cetera, if it doesn't change any outcomes. Well, there are several trials now that show it can change outcomes, although these are single center trials. So this was a study done in Europe, in Germany specifically, where they took 125 patients in the ICU who had an elevated nephrocheck value after major surgery, and they randomized these patients to standard care versus KDGO bundle. 
So standard care is basically what we do at our only at our regular practices, while KD Go Bundle would be more vigilant, really looking at the emphasis on volume therapy, assessing for fluid responsiveness, targeting targeting a higher mean arterial pressure, and required nephrological consults during or consult during randomization to help with monitoring nephrotoxicities and consult and managing these patients. So simple things we think we're doing every day, which we're, I know we're not, because I know at our institution, these simple things also are not done. And what they showed is that there was a 13% reduction in stage two to stage three AKI development in the patients who were monitored more carefully were high risk of AKI by this NephroCheck monitor. They showed it had a reduction in length of stay, of ICU stay, an increased cost or savings, I mean, increased cost savings per patient of over $2,000, but it did not show a difference in need for renal replacement therapy or mortality. There's other studies that have shown similarly this. One other study in the European uh, literature too, same place, but they looked at non-cardiac surgery and showed the same sort of outcome. So what has been thought is how you use this biomarker now is if you have an adult patient, because that's what's been validated for in the ICU, who's on pressors or high risk of AKI, you should consider using the NephroCheck. And then if you have an elevated level greater than 2.0, which is the severest or highest risk of developing AKI, then those you probably need to consider early nephrological consultation, which some studies have shown really can change outcomes. Those at moderate risk is still a positive level between greater than 0 0.3, less than 2.0, then maybe closer monitoring of serum creatinine, serial levels. Think about getting urine microscopy. Think about your antibiotic choice, choices. Thinking, do you really need that CT with IV contrast, et cetera? These sound like simple things, but data that I'm not presenting you today, but I could do a whole talk on it, is that we're not doing these simple things or paying attention. So I do think that this helps us take care of patients better. I'm going to switch topics now. I've been, spoke, I've been focusing most on acute tubular injury since it's the most common cause of AKI in the hospital setting, whether it's in the ICU or on the floor. And I want to focus on acute interstitial nephritis because this is also a very hard diagnosis to make in the hospital setting or in general because the things we learn in medical school don't apply so much to what you actually see in practice. So acute interstitial nephritis is essentially an inflammatory response in the kidneys, like an allergic response, where you have increased neutrophils and inflammatory markers in the interstitium of the kidney in response to certain different antibiotics and uh, other medications. And essentially, most of the time what we see is drug-induced, which is what we see in the hospital. Antibiotics can do it, multiple antibiotics, non-steroidals, Lasix. There's multiple medications that can cause acute interstitial nephritis. Usually, or actually I should say, it's been thought in the past that these patients used to have eosinophilia, uh, urine EO has been positive. That's what we learned in medical school. They have sterile pyuria. They can have white blood cell casts, or they can have hematuria and just pyuria. But what we've learned, unfortunately, is that not very many patients actually have those criteria, which makes acute interstitial nephritis very difficult to diagnose. So if you see something like this, which is a white blood cell cast in the urine, it helps you. But if you don't see it, it doesn't necessarily mean they don't have acute interstitial nephritis. So this is a study looking at urine EOs. And I don't know about you, but I've discouraged urine EOs from even being obtained in the hospital based on the most current studies. This was 566 patients, of which 91 had acute interstitial nephritis diagnosed by biopsy of the kidneys, 43% antibiotic related. And what this showed is that the sensitivity and specificity of urine eosinophilia was very poor even if you had greater than 5% of urine EOs in the uh, urine microscopy. And you can see urine EOs positive in almost every aspect or different type of etiology of acute kidney injury, including acute tubular necrosis. So what I'm going to tell you today from, from acute interstitial nephritis, farewell to the urine EOs. Multiple now 
publications have come out saying that it lacks sensitivity, EOs may not be shed in urine even if present on biopsy, it may lice before visualization, and not all causes of AIN, like I mentioned, have EOs in the renal interstitium, and it lacks specificity. Many other diagnoses have eosinophils in the urine. So it is not indicated in patients with suspected AIN, although I still see it ordered by our infectious disease doctors and some of our uh, primary teams, and I'm trying to discourage that. It should not be used, it cannot be interpreted. So what can we do? Well, if they don't have the other diagnostic cr criteria for acute interstitial nephritis, like pyuria, white blood cell cast, hematuria, what can we do? Well, there's a myomarker that's discovered that is actually pretty good for diagnosing acute interstitial nephritis. This is urine TNF alpha and IL-9. And essentially this again was a study uh, looking at 265 patients who actually had a kidney biopsy were enrolled at two centers. And out of these patients, they took the patients who had interstitial nephritis on their biopsy confirmed by three different pathologists educated, and they assessed this biomarker in the urine, plasma, and kidney tissue samples, and they discovered there was a statistically increase in the urine tumor necrosis factor alpha and urine IL-9 levels in AIN versus controls. And the higher the levels, the more severe of acute interstitial nephritis and the histological features. So these were levels were also higher compared to what you see in acute tubular injury, it distinguished between acute tubular injury. And so they concluded that these are really good markers for providing additional discrimination over the currently available clinical tests, which we know already are poor. So now that I've talked to you about the biomarkers, the diagnosis of AKI, where are we now? What's coming up and emerging in the future regarding the recommendations for the definition and the use of biomarkers, especially since several of these are already available and others are gonna become available soon. So typically our current diagnosis of AKI, as I've mentioned, is for AKI stage one, you have an increase in serum creatinine level or decrease in urine output. The plan now is, is to expand this, to expand our AKI staging and definition. So now in the future, I don't know how near in the future, but it will be in the future pretty soon, we'll have a different staging and diagnostic criteria for AKI based on biomarkers. So now if you have no change in serum creatinine level, and no change, no change or increase to, to, to basically, or a level less, an increase less than, excuse me, 0.3 milligrams per deciliter, and your urine output's intact, then this would be called stage 1S if the biomarker is positive, indicating that these patients are at high risk of developing AKI. If you have someone who meets the classic definition now by serum creatinine and urine output, the classic stage 1 definition, it's gonna be divided into A, biomarker negative, and B, biomarker positive, since they have different prognosis in terms of outcomes. Similarly, for stage two, you're gonna have biomarker negative, biomarker positive, and stage three, and this will give us more prognostic information, hopefully, and help us diagnosis a, diagnose AKI earlier and potentially intervene to change these poor outcomes with these patients. So now just to finish up with, I just wanna talk about the classification etiologies of AKI that you already know, but just talk about what the most common things is we're seeing now in the hospital setting. So you all are aware of this classification scheme, pre-renal, intrinsic versus post-renal. And what I will tell you, which I have already mentioned several times through this talk, that the most common in the hospital setting is intrinsic with tubules and interstitium involved, secondary to infection, sepsis, nephrotoxics, toxins, and this is what we call acute tubular injury. The next most common is likely pre-renal, and I would say acute interstitial nephritis is also pretty common. It's just hard to make the diagnosis, and some of these patients can have bland urinalyses. In the ICU setting, again, whether in the ICU or non-ICU setting, bottom line, all this shows is that acute tubular injury or ATN is a predominantly seen cause of AKI. These are the basic syndromes you see in acute kidney injury in the hospital. The most common that causes ATN is sepsis-associated AKI, nephrotoxic AKI, and cardiac surgery-associated AKI. 
Other things that we see are cardiorenal syndrome, hepatorenal syndrome, abdominal compartment syndrome, and GNs are very rare. And critically ill patients, the most common causes are sepsis, major surgery, cardiogenic shock, and complications with medications. This slide is a little busy, but all I want to mention with this slide is, yes, there are different causes of AKI, different pathophysiology, but why does AKI have increased mortality? Has anyone thought about that? Even though you have a small change in serum creatinine, you have no structural change in the kidney, what is it about AKI that increases your mortality just based on a serum creatinine? Well, we have learned that there's a lot of crosstalk between the different organs. And so AKI has shown to have inflammatory changes in the brain, the heart, the lungs, the liver, the intestines, and all other systems, immune systems. So it's an inflammatory condition, which really affects all different organs, and that increases the mortality and why it makes it so important to prevent it or early diagnosis. We also know that why we have CKD is because over time, as you lose glomerular filtration, you have damage to the kidneys, you have scarring, scarring and fibrosis, which then leads to CKD. So management, last three minutes I wanna spend on management. Interventions in AKI. A lot of things have been trial, but the problem is despite all the different medications with potential animal models being positive or theoretical benefits, there is no drug. The only FDA approved treatment for AKI is not a treatment, it's just support when the kidneys are not working, which is dialysis. So given that all these up and coming biomarkers, new definitions of AKI may help us diagnose AKI earlier and bring more awareness so we can change the outcomes, right now we need to focus on prevention. Recognition of the underlying risk factors is very important. CKD is the biggest risk factor. Other risk factors, age, diabetes, anyone who has effective arterial circulation being low, whether it's from cardiac or liver failure, who are prone to having surgery, nephrotoxins, or sepsis. You have to be vigilant when you see that serum creatinine mildly increase. What can we do differently at that time? Because I would say, and I'm on the acute consult service right now, about 20% of what I see every time I'm on service probably could have been preventable. So prevention is key. Early recognition is key in order to prevent AKI because by the time the creatinine has changed, that's a late manifestation of renal injury and your mortality's already increased. And realize a creatinine is a terrible marker, particularly in elderly or patients with low muscle mass. So this is a KDGOS consensus guideline or bundling for managing AKI. And basically it's common sense, but I tell you that we are doing a bad job as multiple other studies have shown, which I have not presented today. Simple things, discontinue all nephrotoxic agents. Some of us have put an alert system in our EMRs, which have the results in the literature have been mixed about trying to alert physicians to think about the medications. We have an alert system. Ensure volume status and perfusion pressure. If you can't tell the volume status, use other markers, use echocardiogram, other things to be able to assess and be more accurate. Considering the ICU setting, setting functional hemodynamic monitoring, Believe it or not, simple things like monitoring serum creatinine and urine output. There have been studies that show that not every patient gets serum creatinines every day. And we know that urine output is very poorly recorded in most hospitalizations, specifically since many of us don't use urinary catheterizations. Yes, radio contrast procedures can contribute to AKI. Try to avoid them if you can. So these are all the different things you should be vigilantly doing. So in summary, I hope I have brought awareness to you that AKI is bad. It's common. You're going to see it in every profession, especially in the hospital. Serum creatinine is not a good marker. We will have better markers. We have better markers. Some of them are FDA approved. Others will be FDA approved soon. That will help us make the diagnosis and hopefully improve outcomes for these patients. Sepsis, nephrotoxic medications, and major surgery, especially cardiac and heart failure, are the most common causes of AKI, so pay attention to that. 
And that is basically the end of my presentation. So thank you. If I've succeeded in persuading you that AKI is bad and that you need to be vigilant and work on preventing it, then I've done my job for today. And thank you so much for your attention and time. And it's been really, really nice to be here with you virtually. Thank you, Dr. Talwani. Does anyone have any questions? Dr. Miller? No, I was trying to push the applause button. Sorry. Okay. Oh, button. Thank you. <laughs> So thank you all so much for your attention. If you have questions or more want more information about AKI, AKI Education, please email me anytime. Dr. Dr. Sadiq, did you have a question? I saw your hand up. Yeah, I do. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Dr. Sadiq. I'm one of the nephrology fellows here. Uh, yeah. Thank you for the presentation. I had a quick question. If it wasn't already mentioned in your talk, do you mind speaking briefly on uh, this is statin C also as a marker for AKI and what your thoughts are on that. Okay, so, so statin C has had variable, again, um, results in the literature for actually looking at acute kidney injury. It varies by the population. Some of these studies are very even by uh, center to center in terms of the accuracy. So at this time, I can't say statin C is in a high setting for, for looking at AKI but it's more often used in the clinical setting for chronic kidney disease. There's a lot of caveats with it though. It can be affected by different things such as smoking status, obesity, use of uh, prednisone and, and uh, having malignancy. But I think it's a better marker for CKD and not substantiated as least in the adult population for determining AKI. And possibly what's probably going to happen in the future is that not all these biomarkers are perfect. So there's probably going to be a panel of biomarkers. And I just wanted to introduce more of the more common ones that are coming out specifically in the ICU setting. Okay, Dr. Canella. It's good to see you, Professor, even after all these years. Um, I, I actually worked with, with Drs. Warnock and, and Agarwal on service, never with you, but you always consulted on all, all of my patients when I was in the ward. I digress. Um, but um, on, a, on a brief note, on almost like an anecdotal kind of thing. So here at the VA, I do, I run a lot of the outpatient antibiotic services um, here. And so one of the things that I've noticed is that a lot of patients with, you know, right before they also have, have like impending, um, you know, AKI, as you kind of described, I started to notice that their their absolute eosinophil count will start to increase, and and of course I, I know that because I haven't ordered urine EO since I was an intern um, at UAB. But I I wanted to know especially with the IL nine um, that you kind of described as being part of almost like a TH nine kind of uh, you know axis that, that that occurs during these injuries. Is that something else that's anecdotally seen since we know that eosinophils are stimulated by IL nine and and the TH two axis? And I want to see if you wanted to comment on that, especially when you're in the outpatient setting and, you know, people don't, you know, things, bad things happen, especially when patients are at home and I have to kind of bring them in. But I just wanted to see what you thought about that and if there's any merit to even watching the AEC in some of these patients. I do. I mean, I, you know, when I say that urine EOs are, are not that sensitive or predictive, I mean, you have to take the clinical context too. And if you have increasing peripheral eosinophilia, um, I actually do, and there is correlation with that, with having true acute interstitial nephritis in the kidney too. It's just that you don't often always see that. So what you're doing and looking at things, and it's all about the trends and following it carefully, yes, those patients are at high risk of developing AIN. It's just that we just don't see that a lot. At least we don't, the peripheral eosinophilia. But if you do see it, yes, there's association. I hope that answered your question. No, absolutely. Thank you. I just and and if you don't mind, just tell Eric Wallace I said hello. He was. Oh, I class. definitely will. Yes, I definitely will. Absolutely. Ciao. Ciao. All right. Uh, this is Dr. Naveen, uh, Dr. Talwani. Thank you very much. Um, I I could attend here and there. I was in a meeting, but thank you very much. I just want to uh, um, thank you so much for your uh, uh, great talk. Well, thank you. So I have to go back to rounds now and conquer and stomp out acute kidney injury. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all so much. Bye-bye.